All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mindgasms podcast. Very excited to get to talk to, uh, I think <laughs> I might say your name incorrectly here. Uh, is it, is it, is it, uh, is it Daniel Bolelli? That's how, is that how you pronounce it? Damn close. Yeah. It's Daniel. Close enough. Okay. And, uh, of course, a lot of pe a lot of people know him, the awesome historian and, uh, yeah, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself there? Sure, man. Um, I moved to US from Italy back in 1992, so it's a really long time, but somehow my accent is still here. And um, the, um, I, let's see, over the last uh, about 16, 17 years, 17 years by now, I've been teaching in college, I've been teaching history, um, a couple of different universities in Southern California. I've written four books. I host a couple of podcasts, The Drunken Taoist and The History on Fire. Um, those are some of the first things that come to mind. All right. So, yeah, um, I wanted to, I guess uh, we could start off uh, if you want to. I thought I found your your History on Fire episodes on the one about the uh, that gladiator uh, rebellion during yeah. the Roman Empire. I found that one to be really interesting too, and uh, I don't I don't know if you've seen it, but I, I saw this. Uh, there's this sh there's this show called Spartacus that's kind of like the show version of the movie. Have you seen that? Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, <laughs> I like so uh, I like I like that show, and I I was like I was like comparing comparing your episodes to the show when I was listening to it, and it was it was really it was fun to learn like what's historically accurate and what's historically inaccurate but either way it's like a, a fascinating story yes Spartacus was fun he's like the most explicit sex and violence you can watch on tv without crossing into straight up porn it was pretty yeah <laughs> yeah you know oddly enough actually they didn't even do such a bad job historically like they are actually better than most of the Spartacus rendition they have done before oh okay tweak the story a lot. I mean, they still tweak the story, don't, don't get me wrong, but overall, not that bad. Oh, okay. And yeah. uh, I thought it was cool, too, that uh, that you said you did those uh, th those episodes because of the, that story that you started telling on Joe Rogan's podcast about that one part in the story where uh, when, when the Romans finally quelled the rebellion, yeah. they, cru they crucified one of the gladiators one like every 200 yards or something like that 30 yards between 30 yards when rome so all in all is like six thousand people stretched out over 125 miles or something like that wow i mean like can barely even imagine that man that's yeah. six thousand yeah. crucified people that's a little hardcore that's yeah when they really want to send the message yeah yeah like what? Like one thing that uh, that I know you've I've, you've talked about before in your podcast, and uh, one thing that I I like about Dan Carlin in his podcast too is that the the stories of history they're so they're so filled with like treachery and betrayal and violence and brutality stuff. It's like it's like Game of Thrones, but it's shit that actually happened. Right, totally. That's uh, that's exactly what it is. We actually did at one point. I did the, uh, I did an episode comparing Game of Thrones to history, where with a guy who is running a history of Westeros podcast that's all about Game of Thrones. So we did a compare and contrast between like some of the crazy stuff you find in the Game of Thrones books and and the TV show, and then how much of the kind of parallels that exist in history for that stuff. Oh, cool! I haven't I haven't heard that episode. I should check it out. I think is if I don't remember wrong, is episode twenty nine. I called it, of course, with the glorious uh, quote from Tyrion Lannister: "I drink and I know things." Oh yeah, I, oh, Tyrion's my favorite character. He's awesome, and yeah. Um, so yeah, we did the whole episode on that kind of idea of like how for every weird thing that you find in Game of Thrones, you find something just as weird or weirder in history. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot of historical inspiration there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. Isn't, isn't it uh, like partially based 
on real history in the first place or something like that? That's what it is. It's like you can see that uh, our Martin just spent a lot of time um, learning from, you know, studying history and using it to uh, uh, and, and using it to kind of fold there for the game, for the Game of Thrones story. Oh, okay. Oh, that's really interesting. That's wild. Yeah, that's it. I love the I love Game of Thrones too, especially like uh, I, I like the I like the books more than the more than the show because they get more into more into the like the characters and they get more in detail and stuff like that. But but yeah like i mean there's a reason why game of thrones was so popular of course yeah and uh Pretty wild. yeah the uh, the other the other episode series of yours that uh, i wanted to talk about a little bit is that the conquest of mexico one with cortez when he conquered uh was it the aztecs i think yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly this is the clash between the Spaniards and the Aztecs in um, the 1500s in modern New Mexico. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. That's such a, a fascinating story. Like the the way that they took over and the like uh, like when you were describing the way the the wars were fought too and the the way they fought each other and how they fought in different ways and the the um like the the aztecs were confused by the cavalry because they hadn't seen it before and that kind of stuff right yeah it's kind of you know if you've never seen horses they definitely takes a while to get adjusted yeah yeah like uh what what were some actually actually for both that for both that one and the and the the story of the gladiator rebellion what were some of what were some of your favorite parts to research when you were researching for those? Um, I mean, a lot of the research process is a bit painful because you're reading through tech, through books that are not necessarily engaging. They are kind of dry and you have to dig for sort of those okay. nuggets that are in there. So you're, you know, shoveling a lot of mud and then, oh, that's a nice gold nugget, put it aside. I remember you talking about that before, yeah. That's the process, right? I mean, the process, none of, I wouldn't say none, but probably very, very few of the books I read are actually enjoyable to read for the sake of uh, putting together an episode. The goal is to take a lot of dry material and then put it together in a narrative that's not dry and that's fun and engaging. Right. So, you know, a lot of times you're there and you're like, oh, man, it's kind of boring, this is tedious, and you're like, oh, that's a good one. I oh, yeah. Really and so you get... Uh, that makes it like there are some crazy stories at one point like spartacus when the romans build this wall to block him off to kind of keep him inside of italy and he used the bodies of all the dead romans that he had killed to stack them up against the wall to be able to climb over the wall that's insane that's just some pretty wild stuff right there oh yeah yeah for sure definitely um so Oh yeah, so um, I, I'd love for you to tell me a little bit more about Taoism, or or is it pronounced is it pronounced Taoism? I've pr I've heard it pronounced both different ways. It's both? I mean, it's technically it's kind of like between a D and a T, so it's sort of like close enough. Oh okay. So, um, yeah, so like it's a, it's really it's a really interesting concept to me. I mean, I'm only mildly familiar with it. Like I think I told you uh, I read the. Tao Te Ching and I've watched some Alan Watts videos, but I'm still I'm not that familiar with it. But I like the uh the that yin and yang symbol too. That I actually uh I actually look at a yin and yang symbol when I meditate because it's mm -hmm. such a it's such an interesting concept to me, though those sorts of ideas in Taoism. Definitely. Yeah. That reason to me is interesting because unlike most philosophies or religions that you have to be a member to actually practice it, you could be practicing Taoism without even knowing because you don't need to even know what Taoism is to apply its ideas. The ideas are very universal, you know? They are, uh, you get these ideas that are applicable to all situations, to all times. They, they are not specific to one particular school of thought. They are, Really seems that you learn from from life. 
So to me, learning Taoism is funny because you read it and you're like, oh, I guess we call it Taoism, but it's like stuff that you may have thought already or it makes intuitive sense or, you know, it's really revealing some of the principles that are at the roots of how the universe works. Yeah, like I like the the like the ideas that there there are these opposites like like black and white or yin and yang or masculine and feminine or light and darkness, but they're 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 opposites, but they're also kind of part of each other, and the lines between them kind of blur, which is like it, that's a, that's kind of an intuitive aspect too, like you were talking about. I would say like just for for life in general. Yeah, very few things are really that black and white uh, in anything in life. Hardly anything is. And so the way Taoism conceive of duality is not so much good versus evil, is this idea that there are these two opposite energies, you know, male, female, light and dark, uh, cold and hot, that kind of duality. So it's not that one is good and one is bad, they're just part of a continuum. And every situation the solution to every situation is found in the correct balance of yin and yang, which is constantly changing. You know, you cannot apply just, oh, it's a 50-50 deal. No. In one situation, you need to have an energy that's way more assertive, and so you need to be primarily yang with a tiny bit of yin. In another way, assertiveness would not work at all, and you need to use a much more soft, mellow approach that would be more yin-based. In, you know, and it's, so it's, always, it's always a balance, but rather than being a static balance, kind of like, okay, I'll just avoid all the extremes and walk down the middle path, it's a dynamic balance. It's more like surfing, that, you know, depending on which way the wave is going, you need to lean heavily to the right or heavily to the left or somewhere in the middle, and, and you are constantly shifting. And, and I guess the Taoist skill is in reading the context, reading the situation, and figure out what the appropriate balance is for that context and that situation. And I think that's the exact opposite of being dogmatic. You know, people, they, they find something that works and then they want to apply it to all situation and all context. And it's like, well, that's nice and all, but that thing that worked that one time, worked that one time. It's useful to keep that in mind because it may work in another context, but not necessarily. You know, people are different. You cannot communicate the same way with everybody. The same message they will click with one person would have to be very much tailored for a different person for them to click. Uh, you know, there are 10,000 things in life where rarely things are that, like you rarely can apply the same thing, exactly the same in all situations. You know, even if you raise kids, some kids need to hear, they need more of a poor man and they need a little more discipline. Other kids, you stifle them if you put too much discipline. You need to give them more free reign. And, you know, it's like, and that is skill is being able to read it. What is that? Not in the abstract, a kid needs. What does this kid need? Uh, what's the correct way to approach this person, this situation, this context? And so it's, um, it's kind of a talent. It's like cooking, you know, it's like you can follow the recipe and you're not going to screw up too bad, but to really put in the fine tunes is something that no chef can teach somebody else because you learn it by experience, you know. There's that one moment where it's like now, not 40 seconds from now, not 30 seconds ago, it's right now, you know. It's, that's a skill. That's something you develop with experience and awareness. Yeah, yeah, totally. Those, those, uh, both of those analogies of surfing and cooking are very good ones. Like, uh, well, like maybe in in Buddhism, for example, you could say that they're all about ba um, balance in a sense. At least certain types of Buddhism. But mm -hmm. the but if you want to if you want to just have like balance in all things all the time, like you were talking about, sometimes it's better to be to go more towards more towards one extreme than the other like you were talking about and it depends on the situation too so it's it sounds like a much more pragmatic way of going through life in that sense too and yeah like like you were saying too like it, it depends on it depends on not just the situation but the the individual too like what works for this person might not work for this person and i like the I like the aspect of it about being against against dogma too, because they're like uh, 
what I've what I've what I've kind of understood more recent more recently and just and just been learning more about lately is that there there are lots of different ways at looking at different mythologies and religions and each person has their own individual way in that sense mm -hmm. but the but a, a really common aspect of religions that most that most people seem to choose to follow is to follow these dogmatic aspects of it like uh like people like i have um i have some i have some christian friends for example who aren't really dogmatic at all about their christianity but then most other people i know they'll be they might be dogmatic at least about a few aspects like especially if they're especially if they're people i know who aren't really like critical thinkers or anything like that they'll think like jesus is the only way to god or jesus is the only way to heaven or anything like that and that kind of shit is where it just gets annoying for me yeah and people do it with everything you know whether religion every single field of experience people like to get dogmatic for the simple reason that it's reassuring uh, you know, the word dogma is a bad rap, of course, for good reasons. But at the same time, when you look at how much people actually love dogma, even though they don't say it, but in reality, what they do, it's obvious. You know, it makes you feel reassured or something that you can always fall back on. You believe that it's always true in all situations. That appeals to our laziness. You know, it appeals to not having to work so damn hard to figure out each situation, each moment, each person, each... Uh, one is a lot easier than the other. Now, it's a, it's a fake easier because in reality, you're just going for the wrong solution half of the time. You're not really... It's a shortcut that doesn't really take you to the destination, you know, but it's appealing for that reason because there's that sense of safety. It's, uh, it's always there. You can always rely on it, um, at least in theory. In reality, not that much, but that's the theory. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking while you were talking about that, about how the about how you said that this applies to everything, and it, it really does too. Like, and it, like people get people get ideological about everything, really. And like for for with politics, for example, you could say like so like one person could get dogmatic about being a liberal. So liberals have everything figured out. Those fucking conservatives, they're fucking retards. Or a conservative could <laughs> could be a, could be like. Conservatives have everything figured out. Those fucking liberals are goddamn retards. Or uh, libertarians get that way about liberals and conservatives too. Absolutely. I had um, I was reading some reviews for Dan Carlin's political podcast, Common Sense, and it was hilarious because I mean most people like him, rightfully so, because he's awesome. But like the critical reviews were funny because you would get this one guy comes on and he's like. Oh, you know, he makes it sound like he's this nuanced thinker, but really he's a closet conservative who's just trying to push this <laughs> the next review. Oh, he makes it sound like he's the nuanced singer, but really he's a crazy liberal who's out to push his <laughs> Holy hell, it's like people are stuck in that mindset where unless you are 110% on board with my way, then you're the enemy. You know, then you're on the other side. And there are only two sides, right? It's like, if you're not with this group, then you must be with that group. There's no idea that maybe it's a little more complex than that. That, nope, it's like, it's either this or that. It's black or white. It, yeah. That is the exact opposite of Taoism. You know, it's this very black and white as opposite forces. There's a line drawn in the sand. The two opposites are fighting one another and you either pick one or the other. Whereas Taoism tell you the exact opposite, tell you no, they are not fighting each other. It's you have to figure out the harmony of the opposites. No, you don't have to pick one or the other. It's always both. Uh, you have to figure out what the balance is, but it's always both sides. Uh, you know, so in many ways, Taoism is like the perfect antidote to that dualistic thinking, that black and white mentality that leads to our dogma and other unhealthy things. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, I w I would say so. And it's uh, it it's interesting how uh, like how you're just talking about how ideological people get about politics too. Like, uh, like I think isn't uh, I don't know. I guess hasn't Dan Carlin said that? It, I think you might have heard him say before that he's a liberal. But I mean, it 
if I did, even if, uh, regardless of whether I did or not, like if you, especially on his common sense podcast where he, he talks more about politics than anything else, it's, it really seems like he's pretty much like he's pretty much centrist. I would say like he gives equal merit and, and just tries to carefully consider any opinions, whether they're liberal or conservative or anything in between or something like that. So just saying that he's like a closet liberal or closet conservative is really funny. Well, that's what people who are stuck in a dualistic mentality will do. Unless you are perfectly fitting in our camp, then it means you are on the other camp. There are only two choices. There's no other. And, you know, it's a very simplistic view. It, it's kind of like if you think about the whole history of uh, the Cold War, that's how it was. You are either with the Soviet Union or we are with the United States. There's nothing in between. You are either a full-fledged communist or you are in favor of the more hardcore conservative version of capitalism. Nothing. In, it's like... Yeah. That's forcing a really bad dichotomy on reality when it really doesn't work. It's, uh, most people don't fit so neatly in those camps at all. And this desire to push them in those camps is annoying in all situations, whether we're talking politics, whether we're talking anything else, really. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and one thing that I've been learning about more recently in the last couple months or so, or maybe a little longer than that, is that um, perhaps communism isn't quite as evil as I've been led to believe because I had this more this uh like really extreme mind mindset like pro well I guess kind of pro capitalism and anti communism for a while but now I'm like I end up having with almost everything was I guess you could say I ha have more of a more of a Taoist approach to it which is capitalism capitalism is good in a lot of ways it has it has many pros it also has many cons you could say the same you could say the same thing about communism really like history shows the flaw history shows the clear fucking flaws with communism like all the bad stuff that has happened in communist countries especially in russia like you said but that doesn't necessarily mean that the ideas within communism themselves are they're complete they're completely ineffective it, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that i it doesn't mean that i'm saying that i agree with people sure. who are self-proclaimed communists you say no communism just hasn't been tried yet man <laughs> it just means that it just means that maybe there maybe marx had some good ideas i think that's the problem that people get really ideological about these things uh, talking, um, people get lost into isms, you know, this is a good one or this is a bad one. This is, it's like, how about we just focus on specific issues? How about we test things out? Because most things are on a continuum. They are, there is no such thing as complete free market capitalism. And we know how bad it gets when it's like the hardcore totalitarian communism. Um, reality is, Always, I mean, in US, is not even a purely capitalist society. If you look at Northern Europe, they consider it kind of socialist, but also kind of not. There's also a bunch of capitalists. It's like most everything is on a balance. It's not really that either full system one way or full system the other. So the question is, what's the right balance? Where exactly is the good balance between the more socialist approach and the more, uh, the more capitalist one? Well, that's up for discussion. And I think it changes depending on which country you're talking about. It changes depending. And, you know, I think the problem is people become fanboys of one system or another, and then they are blind to trying out things. It's like, to me, there are 50 states in the US. If people feel really strongly about it, why don't you set up experiments? You know, one state can go more on a socialist direction. One state can go in a more free market one. We come back in five years and we see the results. Oh, it turns out that this looks a little more promising. Okay, let's try that. You know, you learn and you... And the whole point stops being so damn ideological. Rather than having to embrace a pure fate in a system, you try things out and you use what works and you live beside what doesn't work. You know, it's a very kind of like, mixed martial art type of thing, where it's like, you know, karate is the way. No, shut up. Judo is the best. It's like, how about we try things out? And hey, it turns out some judo moves are great. And actually, there are some karate things that work. 
how about you just take the best from all system and mix it together? That seemed like so much healthier, and yet people don't do it because they are invested in their flag, their system, their ideology. Their it becomes part of their identity. You know, it's like suddenly, if you acknowledge that there's one good thing that can come from this other system, you are somehow betraying your pure identity into this other system, and it's like. When did human beings decide that they need to become slaves to systems as opposed to using systems to make life better? Why do you have to become the the defender of an ideological system? That's just dumb. Yeah, exactly. Very well said. And and that's like that's like almost a it's a more it's a much more pragmatic approach yeah. and almost like like more of a scientific approach too because you're gonna like. Let's try let's try this experiment here and see if it works. Okay, let's try this other experiment and then we'll gradually feel uh, feel out what works. And that's a uh, that's uh, I'm glad that you brought that up too uh, and mixed martial arts because that that reminds me of uh, mixed mental arts that we were gonna talk a little bit because you've been on the mixed mental arts podcast of course and talked to Brian Callen and Hunter Motts and basically they try to have that sort of mindset like. Let's try to figure out these ideas and try different things and use what works for the given situation and use something and use a different system over here than what works for here, depending on whether the circumstances are different. And that's why I ended up I ended up joining Mixed Mental Arts and participating in lots of the chats. And uh, I would say I've gotten to know Hunter and he's an awesome guy, too. So, yeah, that's a, it's a it's basically like you could tell, you could almost say that the one of the main goals of mixed mental arts in a way is to just kind of take a, a taoist approach to figuring out a lot of these issues totally it's very much that good old bruce lee approach you know bruce lee had this four par system of his idea of how he approaches things where he would say you know there was that whole like a whole element of his system was this idea of absorb what is useful and reject what is useless you know you, you set out there you experiment you try things out once you do that you take the stuff that works you reject the stuff that doesn't and you make it your own thing you know that's uh, it seems so simple like it's like well how else would you be i mean of course that's just the foundation of just free thinking of anybody who's not a complete slave to an ideology and yet it's funny how saying something that should be actually kind of obvious, like if any, if there's any fault in that idea is that it, yeah, it's not the most original thing you've ever heard. And yet the problem is it is original, considering that most people never even dream of going that route. And instead they stick to their ideological guns and nothing else. I mean, Dan Carlin was saying the same thing. He was talking about people praising him, saying, oh, you are such an open-minded thinker, you are doing something so refreshing. And he's like, what's so refreshing about considering all viewpoints before I make up my mind? I mean, it's like it should be the most basic thing that every... I mean, I appreciate the compliment, thank and all, but everybody should do it. It shouldn't be the mark of, oh, what a great thinker you are. It's like, it's pretty damn basic. It only seems refreshing and amazing because even something that's so damn basic, so few people actually use it. That is the problem. So, you know, the bar is set really low. It doesn't really take much to, to be above it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. definitely. It's, 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 it's unfortunate, unfortunate that, uh, that, more people, that more people don't try to practice that because, yeah, I mean, like you said, it, see, it seems obvious, but they, like people get... We, we get so attached to our ideas and the like the important thing to remember I think is that we all get that way about particular sets of ideas from times from time to time like uh, well well basically one of the things that um, brought me to mixed mental arts I would say is that for uh, I've I was a militant atheist for a long time and I thought <laughs> I had this idea about myself that oh, now I am immune to ideology because I know that religion is evil and causes all the world's problems. And then I gradually kind of started to figure out, hey, you know, I kind of know, I kind of know some religious people, and they don't seem like that. It, it seems like the religion, <laughs> their religion, kind of actually helps them make and make them better people and that kind of stuff. And 
<laughs> and so I gradually figured out through just getting it, just fucking chilling the fuck out about religion, basically, and also learning um, from Brian Callen and Hunter Motts on mixed mental arts about the work of people like Jonathan Haidt and David Sloan Wilson, who basically showed that militant atheists replace faith in God or religion with faith in rationality. Sure. But scientifically speaking, according to more recent, more recent work that has been done, contrary to, contrary to the popular misconception, you can't like think rationally and separate it from your emotions. Like sure. emotion and rationality are always linked. So that's another thing that led to me dropping the militant part of my atheism. Oh, completely. I think like people can create an identity and create a dogma around anything, you know, literally around anything. That's why, for example, when I teach, I teach courses in history of religions and, you know, the potential for things to get ugly is high because people are really sensitive when it comes to religion. But one of the reasons why it never happens pretty much is because on day one, what I tell them is, look, stop thinking in terms of labels. You know, Christianity, there are 30,000 denominations of Christianity. There are gay Christians and Christians who want to burn gay at the stake. There are super liberal Christians and super conservative. They're, the only thing they all have in common is they all think Jesus is cool. That's it. Other than that, they disagree on pretty much every topic there is. So stop generalizing. Stop with this idea that the Christian believed. It's like, shut up. No, they <laughs> Christians. Yes, yeah, some do. And some don't. Same thing applies to everything. You know, it's like labels are very misleading. They are perfect for creating stereotypes. But, you know, you can apply to everything. Forget religion. You know, when people talk about feminism, some feminists, what they mean by feminist is they just believe men and women should have equal rights. Well, that's pretty basic, right? That's kind of like every, most everybody who's not a complete freak would agree with that. If you use that definition, then I'm a feminist. And not probably right. lots of people are. <laughs> Other versions are super batshit crazy, man hating kind of feminism. There's everything in between. So, this idea that, you know, anytime we start making statements, generalizing, the feminists are out to, no, 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 qualify that. There are <laughs> three gazillion feminists who are completely different from one another. So, let's not. Same thing with liberals and conservatives, same thing with different religious groups and things with everything, you know. You can make a point about, you know, the majority of so-and-so today or in this country or, sure, you can make those more generalized points, definitely. But when you stretch, uh, this is mostly true, this is, yeah, this is absolutely true, that's when you have a problem. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, that's a... Like basically, the more the more I the more I learn about uh, just in general and about any th any particular topic that I get into, the more I basically eventually come to that sort of mindset. Like maybe I'll start off leaning more towards one side of an argument than the other, but then by the time I've learned about I've learned about it some more, even if my even if my opinion is pretty similar from the way it was at the start. I usually can kind of understand where people on the other side of the argument are coming from, at least. Like, even if my even if my mind doesn't change that much, I can kind of at, at try to understand their perspective. Totally, absolutely, and which is important to have any kind of dialogue. Otherwise, you're just preaching to the choir. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's uh, I find it I find it funny too that like. Uh, like how ideological people get about Trump, because there's this. It, it makes it. It makes me want to make a, a video called uh, "Pro Trumpers and Anti Trumpers Think the Same Way," <laughs> because that's, that's, because there are people who are so pro Trump that they can't find any fault in anything he ever does, and then there are people who are so anti Trump that they think he's uh, both literally mentally retarded and literally conspiring with his nazi buddies to make america a nazi state yeah i mean anytime you find yourself thinking that a person or an idea or something everything about it is perfect or everything about it is evil slow down a second i mean i can probably find give me the most 
horrible ideologies ever. And I'm sure that they got a couple of things right. You know what I mean? Which doesn't justify the, the horrendous other things that they went by. But, you know, you can acknowledge, uh, hey, you know what? During fascism, uh, trains did arrive on time. They were pretty good with that. They were horrible in just about every conceivable other way. <laughs> credit where credit is due. And if they do three good things, you say, okay, those three things are good. The other 300 are horrible. But, you know, those three things I'm down with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and like, that that makes me think of, of the worst example that people usually think about, which, it, which is Nazis. Mm -hmm. And... Like, uh, I mean, you, you obviously probably know a lot more about this than me, but it seems like at the time during Hitler's rise to power, given all the, all the other stuff that was happening in the political landscape, he actually provided a useful service for people. Like he was, if you look at it, if you look at it, uh, Hitler's speeches, which you can still watch on YouTube, he basically mostly seems to talk, use language about like bringing people together. And solve and solving the country's problems and oh. stuff like that. And yeah. and if you read Mein Kampf too, for yeah. example, you you learn you can see how he grew up as a, he grew up as a loner and he was eat his lunches alone and he wanted to be an artist, but his father didn't want him to. And his fa and his and his father was an asshole to him, and his mother didn't do anything about it. So none of that at all excuses anything that Hitler did at all. But it kind of just provides you with some context for how he became such a fucking monster. Totally, and I think it's important both to understand why people are the way they are, as well as a knowledge that hey, you know, maybe I disagree. Like for example, with Nazism. The solutions are overwhelmingly bad, right? What Nazism has done is pretty terrible. But if you don't understand what pushed millions of Germans toward Nazism, and not just stupidly pushed, like there were legitimate issues there. The Treaty of Versailles let screw them over. Their economy was in shambles. They had three gazillion problems. And so they were looking for something. They were looking for the guy who would say, let's make Germany great again kind of thing, you know? And Hitler did it very well. Now, his solutions were pretty awful, but there were some real problems that needed to be addressed that nobody had an answer to. Hitler's answer was also horrible, but at least, you know, the reason why people fell for it is because he looked like the strong guy who would have an answer to a problem that no one else is tackling well. And so, of course, people go for it. Again, people mistake understanding for justifying, you know, just because you say, oh, I understand why he became the way he was, doesn't mean you don't put a bullet in his head, just mean you understand it. Then you can also still act the way you do. People have this idea that sometimes if you start understanding somebody, you're really providing an alibi. It's like, no, you're still a human being who makes choices and there are consequences for those choices. Just because there's a rational reason for why you're ended up the way you are, doesn't mean that the behavior you take are to be justified no matter how horrible they are. There are certain lines that you don't cross. And when you cross them, regardless of what bad things happen to you or you are abused or whatever, well, I get it. That said, you still cross a line you shouldn't have. You still got a bullet in the head. That's just how it is. You know, there are certain things from which there is no, no coming back from, you know? Yeah, definitely. That's, <laughs> that's why I think, uh, I think Joe Rogan has a joke on one of his specials where he's talk he's talking about using a time machine and yeah. if people if people could choose one spot to go back in time in a time machine fucking everyone would go back would go back to like take a shit on Schittler's head and <laughs> and at one point you would go back in the time machine and he would just be covered in a giant fucking mountain of shit cuz so many people would do that I saw a, there was an hilarious meme. There was a picture of Hitler with, uh, like, why do time travelers keep trying to kill me? I'm just an artist. And it was Hitler in like 1914 <laughs> or something, where it's like, what's with this? You know? <laughs> oh, that'd be so hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, inter it's interesting how people get about that. It's, in I didn't even, uh, I didn't even know until fairly recently um, when I took a history of World War II class. I think uh, I think it was last year or the year before 
that Hitler modeled Hitler modeled his uh, his fascism after or like his political ideology that became Nazism, I guess, after Mus after Mussolini's Italian fascism, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's, it's funny how those, um, you know, that was a period of uh, popular dictators, you know, Mussolini and Hitler and the whole Japanese government system. They, they were, ban never mind in Russia, same thing with communist dictators. And, and it's funny how that thing seems to keep coming up, like human beings, despite the fact that we say that we don't like dictators, really do like dictators. They find something appealing in dictatorial authoritarian figures. Because the reality is that lots of people are insecure. And they need a father figure to tell them everything is going to be OK, son. Just do what needs to be done, follow the program, and it will all be taken care of. It's so appealing. Uh, I mean, even today, if you look at like a bunch of world leaders, there are some, if they are not outright dictators, they are pretty close to that, you know, that, or at least the appeal is the same kind of appeal of like, I'm the strong man who's going to take care of you all. I'm not a wimp like my opponents. We are going. And that stuff, politically, you see it. You see it with, I mean, I've seen the success of some public figures writing books and things who are clearly appealing to that same demographic, clearly appealing to, I'm your father figure who's going to give you the basics of life and pat you on the back kind of thing. It's something that so many humans seem to need. I guess there are lots of shitty fathers out there, and so people need uh, some surrogate father figure because their real father sucked. Uh, that's my guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. Like there, like uh, I find uh, I find arguments for for anarchism interesting. Like uh, like people like Michael Malice, for example, when they make arguments about it. But I mean, again, uh, I mean, I'm not a I'm not an expert on politics or anything like that. But it seems to me like complete anarchism wouldn't be that effective, like partially because of what you were talking about. Like some people would probably be fucking great with anarchism and they would treat other people well and stuff like that. But some people, they want that power. They want that powerful leader and they want people to do things, to take care of shit for them and to take care of them. And, and I mean, it, when people get, when people get out of control as dictators, like, like Hitler, like we were talking about, or I mean, like even perhaps like someone, uh, someone who's willing to do something ruthless, but isn't necessarily isn't necessarily like fucking at least borderline evil, like Hitler was, or something like that. It seems like sometimes they serve, they even serve a valuable purpose to society in a way. Like uh, I made this short video recently. Um, based off of the of the quote of the have you seen the the season 1 of that show true detective yeah i saw that one yeah oh i love that show like especially season 1 and the character rust in that show i just made this short video called based off of one of his quotes where he says the world needs bad men they mm -hmm. they keep other men from the door and uh, i talked a little bit about how you could easily interpret that as like people getting out of control and becoming like someone like Frank Underwood on House of Cards, who's just a fucking psychopath who uses power for his own personal gain. But yeah. it's, it seems sometimes like within the context of the way Russ talks about it on that show, how if you're aware that you're like a person who's capable of doing ruthless shit to other people, you can you can put your put that nature in yourself to good use by becoming becoming a cop to like on the show it's cops who are using that sort those sorts of skill sets to literally catch a serial killer mm -hmm. so that can be a useful to society sometimes i think totally no i agree completely yeah yeah that's uh oh i mean it's interesting that you've uh you've seen uh true detective too so uh what do what do you think about like the the philosophy of the character Rust on that show? Because especially the first time I've I saw that, because I think I'm kind of like naturally pessimistic. I agreed with like ninety five percent of what he said, but since I've seen it like two or three times now, and I've learned a lot more about philosophy and psychology since then, I've 
I agree with like less, less of what he says, because I can see that a lot of his really negative mindset about life comes from it comes from the fucked up life that his character has had, like his daughter dies and then he divorces his wife and he gets addicted to drugs and he goes undercover in narco and becomes a drug addict and all this terrible shit happens to him. So what, what do you think about him on that show? The thing to me is that it's like, yeah, life is rough. There's no argument there. There are a lot of existential conditions of life that are extremely rough. Once we acknowledge that, though, either find a way to still make it where you can be happy within the existential harsh conditions that life presents, or shoot yourself. You know, it's like, like the whole... Uh, uh, life is hard and terrible and rough, uh, pessimism. It's like, why are you still talking? You know, we're done. It's like, if you have established that it's so bad, why have you checked out already? And I don't mean it in a, fuck you, I don't want to listen to you complaining. I'm just saying, like, throw the logical conclusion from what I'm here saying. Otherwise, it's just like, if your, op if your avoidance of suicide is based on laziness, or just, it's like, that's not a good reason, you know? It's like, you should want to be alive, you know? It's like, what makes you want to get up in the morning? And I understand everybody goes through rough patches when there are the times when you don't, are not so sure why you're getting up in the morning. So I'm not saying, you know, you're having a bad day, go shoot yourself. But at the same time, it's like, at some point, you need to figure out a way out. Otherwise, you're just going by inertia. And so yeah. to me, it's like, as a philosophy of life, having this super negative outlook, it doesn't make sense. It's like, that's a philosophy of death. It's not a philosophy of life. It's like, if that's the conclusion that you reach and you feel they are done looking, why are you still around? You know, it's like, I don't quite get that. Yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. Because like, uh, I remember on the, on the show, the character Marty asked him that question, like, why do you even get a get out of bed in the morning? Yeah. And he's and he says, "Well, I like the Constitution for suicide, but really, it's just my programming." <laughs> but like, <laughs> like you're saying, it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound fun to go through life that way. Yeah. Like that's why, for me, for example, like I said, I kind I kind of seem to have pessimistic tendencies. But in more like more recently, in more recent years, what I've gradually figured out is that. Yeah, I can see, I can easily see the bad side of things, but I don't want to go through life living my life that way because it's not fun and it's not very useful to me to just go through life just despairing all the time. I'd rather try, to, I'd rather try to see the positive side of things and then it helps me have a more realistic perspective and it helps me thrive in life a lot more. And speaking of dualism, on that topic, half of the time you hear people who are either like the happy cheerleaders of everything is for the best, everything is wonderful, and it's like, no, motherfucker, it's not. There are a lot of terrible things that happen. There's a lot of stuff in life that's not fun or wonderful or even useful. And or they turn into the opposite. If they start going that route, then they're like, oh, everything is doom and gloom. There's no hope. It's all terrible. And it's like, yeah, but he's up a little, you know, there's also champagne and strawberries, you know, there's also good stuff in life. There's also, and again, it becomes very either all or nothing. Either you're the happy cheerleader who's completely in denial about the roughness that life presents, or you are the ultra pessimistic, dark, negative person. It's like, Neither one is useful. One, because it's fake, and the first time that life slaps you around, uh, unless you're a complete master on denial, you'll come to your senses that it's not that pretty. And the other one is like, yeah, maybe you're right, but you know, what's the point? Shoot yourself at this point. To me, it's like, even in that, I'm interested in realistic optimism, you know, acknowledging the fact that there are a lot of terrible, harsh things that happen in life and try to find a way to be happy in spite of that, in spite of the fact that that exists and you know it exists. That to me is a little more of a real approach. The other two are ideological. Again, it's like trying to put on an all white or all black blinder on that you perceive reality through. Yeah, yeah, definitely, exactly. Like the, and like you can, like you can get too positive, like you were saying, like you were saying too, like that, like 
like both of both of those extremes annoy the shit out of me personally mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. now like like oh everything is amazing no it's not a it's not amazing life it life is good sometimes but sometimes it's also bad but then if you get if you get to the other opposite end of the spectrum like you like you were saying it can just be it can just be like oh the world is a disease yeah. we're all just gonna die Totally. <laughs> there's um there's a quote by this guy i really like EQ sojun he was a zen guy from the 1400s who says throw me into hell and i'll find a way to enjoy it <laughs> that's an awesome quote i dig it it's not yeah. denying that there is some real harshness out there but he's saying okay you know those are shitty cards to have but i'll play them in the best i can and hopefully i'll find a way that's that's i still find a good way to play them despite the fact that they are horrible cards yeah yeah that's the that's a good way to approach life i think yeah because otherwise you get the people who try to convince you that when you are handed shitty cards no really it's a gift because you learn more it's like shut up these are bad cards <laughs> and at the same time you got the people like oh these are bad cards it's the end of it all uh, why am i so unlucky and it's like well the game is still going so unless you decide to check out find a way to play them well yeah it sucks where you're at but it doesn't mean it's the cards don't determine the game you know the yeah. cards influence the game that's a very big difference yeah exactly yeah well well put that that re that reminded me of uh of politics again because like uh the like people have this people have this mindset that uh that a lot of people anyway seem to have this mindset that either trump is going to destroy the world or he's bringing us to a new golden age and it seems it seems more likely that i mean uh i'm not i'm not that convinced overall that trump being president is that different from what it would have been like if hillary clinton was president and even not that different from when obama was president you know the thing that I tend to, because for the most part, I agree. I mean, I find politicians of all stripes who have a chance of winning office pretty awful across the board. The one thing that I notice is that, generally speaking, when it comes to environmental issues, Democrats are pretty bad, but Republicans are infinitely worse. Yeah, and that's that seems true. Yeah, that's one of those that tend to bug me because I see not that I see that one side is good, nowhere close. Democratic policies on the environment are terrible, but Republican policies about the environment are terrible to the tenth power. They are just so bad; it's like almost stereotypical how bad it is. And so, yeah. that's usually, the one, one of the things that tend to bug me the most, where I'm just like, this is more than uh, you know, yeah, Clinton would bomb a bunch of countries, Trump would bomb a bunch of people, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, yeah, I get it. That's how what they are all gonna do. Some things, though, they definitely rub me the wrong. So would would you would you say your biggest problem with Trump was him trying to dismantle the EPA? Yeah, I mean, and it's not even just Trump. Like across the board, uh, Republican environmental policies are just awful. Uh, Democratic ones are unsatisfying for sure. They are they are not steering toward a good course. They are just going toward a bad course, less fast and in less dramatic fashion. You know, it's kind of like Democrats drive the train toward destruction at 60 miles an hour. Republicans drive the train toward destruction at 180 miles an hour. Like, it's not that one is doing something great. It's just one is less awful than the other. So, uh, um, how, how so in that respect? Like, what, like, based on, um, yeah, I mean, like just on what sort of things that the, the yeah. Democrats and the Republicans do? Um, both Democrats and Republicans tend to be pulled out to business interests. Um, when it comes to environmental things, Republicans more so. I don't know if it's a matter of Democrats have more of a pro-environmental lobby pushing them or what the reasons are, but the fact is there tend to be a bit more environmental protections and laws setting aside the land and making sure that stuff doesn't get wrecked left and right under Democratic administration that there are under Republican ones um again usually those laws i find them far from satisfying but with the lack of those laws is downright tremendously bad so that's 
usually what I see with pretty much across the board. Like I, I can't think of one time when I saw a Republican. I mean, okay, maybe under Nixon there were a couple of decent ones when it comes to the environment. Other than that, I really you have to go back that far to find something even remotely decent when it comes to Republican ones and the environment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the that that that's true, I would say. And uh and I mean like it, in in me saying all this, I'm not trying I'm not trying uh I know I know I kind of said that earlier, but I'm not trying to say that I'm all like pro Trump or anything like that. Like <laughs> there's certainly lots of things that he's done that I don't like. <laughs> no, no, I and mean, in fact it, but I agree, it's like some things is it's kind of on par for politicians who are in the White House, you know. When's the last time you saw a president that you like? Yeah, good luck, you know. Can think of too many examples of people I actually liked. Um, there are some that are less awful than others. That's about it, you know. But in terms of fitting it like there's a clear light and darkness there, no, there isn't. It's, uh, there are different degrees of crap. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, which is not, doesn't exactly make you excited. It's kind of like... Vote for so and so is at least fifteen percent less crappy than the other one. It's like not exactly a slogan you want to get excited about, but still, fifteen percent is fifteen percent. Sometimes you'll take it, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and like it, and like we were uh, talking about earlier, like that doesn't like a, just understand understanding that in general politicians aren't aren't going to be that different overall doesn't necessarily mean that you have to get all like nihilistic and just decide oh there's no point in i guess there's no point in voting that 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 just annoys annoys me when people do that because like even if it, even if depending on where where you live your vote doesn't count as much as it does somewhere else to me there's still there's still a point in voting and trying to trying to get the world the way you want it because yeah. you might as well try yeah no i agree it's like if the only choice you have uh, in that department is between crap and more crap well crap it is then you know it's like yeah. it's still you know doesn't mean you can try other things but sure if that's the only power you got in that situation use it in the less destructive way possible there's why just say oh it's all crap anyway well yeah but there are differences so it's like pick uh, whatever adapt the points and see what seems less destructive to you and pick that one you know yeah that this the this whole poli this whole political landscape has got it see it seems like uh based on what Dan Carlin said recently about his common sense podcast that it's got him so confused that he decided to stop doing his common yeah. sense podcast for a while, right? Yeah. I think I think you commented on that uh, the last time you were on Joe Rogan's podcast. Did you did you say something about how uh, you think he should still do it? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think he's precisely. I think there are a lot Dan very understandably but he's listening too much to the people who are loud and the reality is that there are a lot of people who are not loud who would greatly benefit from it and badly want what he has to offer but of course anytime you do that you're gonna have people who are loud on both sides who are gonna be yelling at you telling you that you are horrible and terrible and you don't understand anything and it's just like that's the price to pay for putting stuff out there it's like I think Dan is like, okay, I can do a history show and everybody likes it, you know, the hardcore conservative, the super liberal, the epic. I don't need to put up with this crap, forget it. I'm just gonna do the things that I don't get yelled for. And I get it, but at the same time, it's like, but precisely because it's such a contentious moment in history, it would be nice to have more voices who are not completely demented and are actually have something interesting to contribute where they force you to think about stuff. Um, so to me, Dan's voice would be as important as it is to have. But I do get it that he just doesn't want to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, I basically completely agree with what with what you said. I mean, it it would be so great for him to still be doing his common sense podcast right now. Like his his podcast is my fa is my favorite way to learn about what's going what's currently going on in the political situation because he's just so. 
he's so measured and he yeah. just evenly considers everything. And then he go, and then he usually looks at it from a historical perspective, which I appreciate too. But then again, like you said, I, I understand him not wanting to, uh, not wanting to engage with that whole hassle and just do his history podcast because his history podcast is awesome too. And lots yeah. of people love that regardless of political affiliation. Totally. It's like once you do something that even remotely has to do with politics, at least 50% of the people are going to hate your guts. And so that's a little annoying just right off the bat before you even say anything. Yeah. Uh, so did you hear that uh, that last Dan Carlin podcast, that painfulainment one? Yeah, uh, he actually had just released a new one after that. Like I think two days ago, he, uh, he just put out a new one. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Got one on uh, Japan. Oh, cool. What um, like what specifically is it about? Well, it's probably going to be World War II, the Japanese experience in World War II. But you know, in good old Dan Carlin fashion, he starts like. Three million years for earlier Japanese college, you know, very oh, okay. And he's then getting closer to that. Oh, okay. Um, uh, oh yeah, the um, us talking about Spartacus earlier kind of uh, reminds me that did you hear that um, his Kings of Kings series? What about it? The, oh yeah, uh, I, heard I was that. Uh, I was interested. Um, actually, this reminds me too. I've I, I've heard you talking before. Uh, um, about the idea of warrior mythology and kind of like this this idea of like pra praising the the warrior and kind of how it ties into um, mixed martial arts a little bit and having this like this I I, I kind of I, I kind of apply this sort of idea to when I do workouts a little bit just like imagining that what I, the weights or whatever I'm using are like these monsters coming to kill my family and I have to defend and I have to defend them from them. So it inspires me to do a workout. And the, it, may, uh, it makes me think about the, um, uh, the Kings of Kings podcast where they were talking about the, the 300 story and yeah. he was talking about the battle of Thermopylae and the Persian empire and that kind of stuff. So, uh, what, what, uh, what do you think about that in terms of warrior mythology and that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, there are there are a bunch of great examples there, and definitely that one is one. And there's and sometimes you know whether the historical truth of events is exactly the way the myth advertises or doesn't is almost secondary because the mythology is important regardless of you know history and mythology. Sometimes they intersect, but they can also be different things, and that's okay as long as you don't think that literally something is historically true. Who cares? Uh, take it from wherever it can. So there is Game of Thrones or history or whatever. It's like the sources of inspiration are, hey, take it wherever you can get it, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I love that's why like uh I I literally almost feel almost feel mythological about the movie three hundred when I watch it sometimes. Yeah. Like just see just seeing like King Leonidas being all like being like a bad motherfucker and just going and just going after and just charging into battle. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's just like a man thing in in a, in the sense. But it's just like just uh, like whenever whenever I see those sorts of moments, I just feel this like sense of, sense of inspiration so strong that I feel like chills running down my spine almost. Totally, and I think it's important to find those sources of inspiration because we all need them. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So, what if um, uh, what do you have a a favorite source of like a favorite source of warrior mythology? Yeah, I mean, I have a bunch. I mean, it's kind of like even like the first book I wrote was uh, called "On the Warrior's Path." So, you know, that right there tells you that's a topic that I'm into. And um, yeah, I mean, the list changes over time and gets updated and gets the. But yeah, I mean, even the fact that I always mention, I mean. Kind of as a joke, but kind of not. The fact that to me, uh, Conan, as in the, uh, the character created by uh, Robert E. Howard, is uh, a philosophical role model. I dig Conan. He's great in so many ways. You know, it's, uh, it's like stoicism in action. There's so much good stuff there. So, oh, by the way, funny, just as we're talking, I just see I got a text from Dan Carlin as we speak. Oh, cool. 
the um, yeah so check out conan if you haven't robert e howard awesome yeah i i actually haven't i haven't read the books before but uh i i remember you talking about him before i remember i remember joe rogan hearing joe rogan talking about how they were mean really meaningful to him as he was growing up too i've still i've still only seen like the the arnold conan movies which probably probably aren't as good the first one was great the first one was really well done yeah the, the second one was terrible but the first one was good yeah, that's that's kind of what I thought of the movies too. Actually, I I actually rewatched the first one fairly recently and is still thought it was pretty cool. But the, then when I watched the second one, it seemed like ridiculously cheesy to me. But yeah. it, it's interesting that uh, you, you mentioned uh, stoicism in action too. Stoicism is actually another interest of mine too. I got I got into that um, like a lot of people because of Tim Ferriss, and then I just started and now I've read Seneca and Epictetus and uh, I actually interviewed a, a professor of philosophy who teaches Stoicism uh, William Ferriolo on my podcast uh, earlier on and uh, and I read his book too it's called um, meditations on self-discipline and failure and it's it's really interesting that I love that aspect of Stoicism just just it's kind of like this pragmatic approach and acknowledging the bad parts of life in a sense but then figuring out what figuring out useful ways and simple and simple tactics to use to help you live your life effectively totally if, uh, but still, like if you have a chance check out uh, old um, robert e howard stories you know there are other current stories that are not nearly as good check out the robert e howard ones that are great because you're gonna see so much of the good stoicism in that that it's you know it's gonna click because it's gonna be philosophy but part of a story so uh, it's gonna be a good deal. That's always fun. Yeah. Yeah. There were uh, there were some that were not written by Robert E. e. Howard. Yeah, yeah. there are oh. a bunch of imitators who then have picked up the stories and they suck. They're terrible. Oh, okay. I'll check out those original Robert E. Howard ones then. That sounds really interesting. I didn't know that there was so much stoicism integrated into them. You'll find it, especially because you have read stoicism already, so you'll recognize it. you find a lot of it. Cool. Uh, do you, uh, who's your favorite stoic? Um, Conan. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That Sounds is. like you really, really, really need to read Conan. Yeah, Conan is the way to go. Uh, it's yeah. I, I read it to my daughter even. She digs it. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, we watched Conan the Barbarian together when she was five. She dug it. And, uh, oh, that's cool. Well, Conan stories are some of her favorites. Who is her favorite character? In Conan? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's not much other than Conan, right? It's kind yeah, of, <laughs> yeah, that's a good uh, point. <laughs> most everything else is not that, but you know, she digs it all. She has fun with all of it. That's cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Great. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, sorry. I in a little bit. I need to start hitting the road. So. Okay. All right. Actually, that's what I was just going to ask you about because I know we're. I think we're past the time that you said you had so yeah we can uh we can end it here if you want to cool man yeah um, all right well thanks so thanks so much for talking to me man i really appreciate well, it and I, I hope we can do it again sometime too totally i think yeah. like, you may want to go back and there are a couple of moments where there was a bit of noise at the beginning you might want to do a little bit of oh okay yeah that one otherwise for people listening will get in the way they'll be like oh what the hell but yeah if you can just nip the tiny little bit, I think the rest will be good. All right. All right. So uh, I'll just uh, say the things that I like to say at the end of end of all of my videos here. And then you can just uh, give any plugs that you want to for your podcast and your books and stuff. And I'll add the links for your podcast and uh, maybe a, a few of your books and whatnot to the description of this video, too. All right. Uh, so, all right. So... Thanks, everyone, so much for watching another episode of the Mindgasms podcast. Very excited that I got to talk with Daniele Bellelli here. And uh, 
Thank you. And thank you so much for everyone who's subscribed to my channel and to everyone who's contributed to me on Patreon. And thank you so fucking much to anyone else who subscribes to my channel or contributes to me on Patreon. I really appreciate it. You have no idea how much it means to me. And uh, also, as always, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. And most importantly, always remember this, the funk cures all. All right. So you got any uh, plugs there, Daniel? Um, anybody want to check out my stuff? History on Fire podcast, the Drunk and Taoist podcast. I have a few books out there. But I think, you know, it's like by now anybody who's got Google can find out stuff quickly. So, you know. Is your most recent book uh, How to Create Your Own Religion? Um, no, I did one called Not Afraid. Right, right. Okay. That one is more, one is more personal than anything I've ever written. It's, um, there's a lot of more, I mean, there's some philosophical ideas, but it's also very, very, very personal. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, again, thank you so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. And, uh, all right. Thank you everyone so much for watching and, uh, adios until next time.